began swimming at midnight from Catalina Island to the mainland of California. It was such an amazing thing because it was just an idea. There were a group of five of us who were 14 years and under, the youngest was 12, and we decided that we wanted to swim 21 miles from Catalina Island to the mainland of California. When you swim from Catalina Island, you start at midnight and everything around you is pitch black except for the paddle boards beside you with lights on board and lifeguards that were guiding you along and the escort boat way out in front of you. And all you can hear are the splashes of your hands and those of your friends. As you swim through the water, you're enveloped in blackness and coldness and you look down into the dark water and you can see these phosphorescent bubbles coming off your fingertips. And as you look up toward the sky, it sort of opens up and you can see Mars and Jupiter and the planets and the sun starts to rise and you climb up higher on the surface of the water to let the sun warm your back. As you keep swimming, we had been probably four hours into our Catalina swim. Nancy Dale, one of our team members, wound up being hypothermic and having to pull out of the water. We continued swimming for six hours, and at that point, I was swimming stronger. My coach had been a four-time Olympic coach, a man named Don Gambrell, and I was so lucky because when I was swimming in Long Beach, California, Gambrell attracted the best swimmers in the world. So as you're swimming in lane eight, where I was, in the slowest lane, I could look over and see Gunnar Larsson, who would get the gold medal in the 400 IM. Could see Gary Hall, who would get the gold medal in the 100 fly. Could see Hans Faschnut, who would get silver medal for Germany. And I was, you know, 12 years old at that time, and I'd go over to these guys and say, can you watch my butterfly and help me? Will you watch my flip turn? Okay, can I watch you, Gnar, and see your flip turn for freestyle? And I don't know why I wasn't afraid, but I just felt like, you know, these guys were the best in the world. There was also Shirley Babishoff, who was one of the fastest women in the world, and I'd go to her as well. And what I learned back then is that when you're in the world of breaking times and trying to be the fastest, you find this core of other athletes who are willing to help you, or appreciate you when you're like just the beginner. And so these guys helped me, and, and gals as well. And as time went on, I realized that, you know, I really like to swim the distance events. But what my Olympic coach recognized was that there was no pool long enough for me. Um, after a four or five or eight mile workout in the pool, he saw that I was going faster than I did at the beginning of the workout. So he was so smart and suggested that I swim from this shores of Seal Beach to this oil island and back again and entered the women's division. So I did when I was 14 years old and I won the women's and came in the third in the men's. So after that swim, I heard about this group from Seal Beach who was planning to swim across the Catalina Channel and asked them if I could join them. And their coach welcomed me. So we started from Catalina at midnight and got halfway across. Nancy had to get out, continued on. Sun rose. We kept going for hours, um, nine hours, 10 hours, 11 hours. The currents carried us up and down the California coast. We finally made it to shore in 12 hours and 36 minutes. We were cold and tired, and my friends decided they never, ever, ever wanted to do a channel swim. But, you know, I had in the back of my head that I wanted to swim across the English Channel. When I was nine years old, one of the moms on the team saw that I had this ability to go long distances and said, I bet someday you'll swim across the English Channel. So that day I went back home and with my mom and dad and um, we had covered our bodies with lanolin, which is the oil of the wool of sheep. And we were told that it would keep us warm, but actually it just was really sticky and really smelly and I couldn't wait to get it off. So you, I used this great big detergent bottle and put it all over me and got it off my swimsuit and thought, you know, this was the coolest thing in the world. To be 14 years old and to be a, with a group of kids and to be the first group of kids to swim across the Catalina Channel. We had swum a total of 27 miles. 
Um, so I went to my folks the next morning and said, I'd really like to swim across the English Channel. Will you help me do that? And they said, sure. So Don Gambrill, the Olympic coach, adapted workouts from the Olympic swimmers and pool swimming to the ocean. And then my mom or my dad would walk with me along the beach as I swam just offshore. And the thing that helped me so much in this training was that no matter what kind of current I had, either if I was going into it or is on my back, that my parents would walk at a certain rate along the beach. And so I would have to be able to feel the current and judge the speed of it and adjust my speed to the current. So sometimes I'd be like flying down across the water, and other times it'd be like this huge resistance against it. But what it helped me do is figure out what my pace was. So when I was 15 years old, because I'd been around the best swimmers in the world, my goal was to go to England, to swim the English Channel, and to break the world record for men and women. When you swim the English Channel, like with Catalina from England to France, it's 21 miles. And so I felt like, you know, I've trained really hard, I have a great crew, but the other part that played into this is luck. Whenever you do something that's adventuresome or exploration, luck comes into play. And when I got to England, I called the list of different pilots that you can get for swimming across the English Channel. And I called the first guy, he wasn't there. I called the second guy, he wasn't there. I called the third guy, and it was Reg Brickle. Reg had taken the most record-breaking swimmers across the English Channel. And so when I told him that I was planning to do this, he actually took me seriously. We met, and I waited for three weeks for the weather and the tides to coordinate. When you swim across the English Channel, you swim on a neap tide where you have half a moon. Not a full moon, because you have a full tide, and with a full tide, you have lots of water movement. So we waited for the weather and for the tides to coordinate it. Started from Shakespeare Beach near Dover, and started swimming toward France. The water was pitch black. Um, and I'd never been to France before, but I'd been imagining it for years. I'd pulled out the National Geographic and looked at it, and looked at the map, and I looked at the distance, and I looked at England, and I looked at France. I imagined over and over and over again what it would feel like, what it would look like, what it would be like to land on the French shores. Got about halfway across the English Channel, and it was pitch black, and I started feeling these things rolling around my body. And it felt like heads that had been cut off. And I couldn't tell what it was because there was really not a lot of light on the water because you don't want a lot of light on the water because you can attract fish. And those, track, those fish can attract other fish. And, and you can be swimming with sharks. And that's not what you want to do. So you don't have a lot of light. So I'm swimming along. And finally, I yelled up to Reg and said, what is in the water with me? And he just started laughing. He said there was a barge that dumped all these rotten lettuce heads into the water. <laughs> And you've been swimming for the last hour through them. Well, years later, a friend named John York would swim the English Channel. And he said, I knew I was almost in France when I started swimming in this huge area of croissants. And he said, <laughs> and he said you know, I was so hungry that all I wanted to do was pick them up. But I just noticed there was a little mold. So I decided that it was probably not a good thing. That's the other thing that you learn is when you're doing these things that are really out there, you're always experimenting beforehand to try to figure out what's going to work, what you can eat that will give you energy. And so when you swim a long time in salt water, you start getting your throat's really irritated and your, and your tongue starts to swell up and, and nothing really tastes good. But what I finally figured out was that Warm apple juice worked because you want to put warmth into your system. You want to think of your body like a thermos, and you want to warm the core up. And I would also eat oatmeal raisin cookies because when they threw them to you from the boat, you could get them usually before they sank. And they didn't go into total mush, so, but they also were, they tasted pretty good. I swam the English Channel as far as the three-quarter mark, and the tide started to change. That meant that it was like probably... 17, 18 miles from shore, had to start sprinting. Um, my pilot said that at that point, I was about four hours ahead of the men's record. Continued swimming, continued to watch the finish line go backwards. But he was the best pilot you could ever get. And he kept changing the course of the, of the boat, um, finally wove our way through the current. I reached shore, climbed out on the rocks, and looked up, and I saw three people on the cliffs in France, and they yelled in French, Tu nage la manche? Did you swim the channel? And I had been practicing all night long. <laughs> oui, je nage la manche. 
yes, I swam the channel, and you could hear three people clapping. <laughs> and I knew I had made it to France for the first time in my life. It was so great. And then you climb back down, and then you get into the dory, and then you get onto the boat, and we have a, an official on board to make sure that you have swum from one shore to the other, that you haven't touched the boat, you haven't cheated. All you wore was a bathing cap, goggles, and swimsuit. So he was the one that kept the official record of the time, and he said, you know, Lynn, you broke the woman's record by about an hour and the men's record by 20 minutes. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. So it doesn't matter how old or young you are, it just matters that you have a dream and you start working toward it. From there, I would go on to swim the English Channel again, break the world record again, and then I decided to do things that had never been done before. One was Cook Straits between the North and South Island and New Zealand. The thing that made that so difficult was that after five hours of swimming, the current had carried us back around the no North Island, so I'd been going backwards for five hours. Um, but um, people from all over the country, people from... Um, they, they started calling out to the boat, saying, we believe you can make it, keep going. And then Prime Minister Rowling from New Zealand called out and said, you have the support of the people of New Zealand behind you, keep going. So after 12 hours and two minutes, I made that swim. From there, I'd go on to swim across the Bering Strait. The idea for that was, was because my dad and I were talking about it. He explained that, you know, here's the United States and here's the Soviet Union. This is a little diamede and this is big diamede. In a straight line, the distance is only 2.7 miles. So if you swim from one country to the other, you will help to open the border between the two countries. So for 11 years, I wrote to Brezhnev, he died, and Tropov, he died, Chinyanku, he died, and finally Gorbachev gave permission for the swim. The swim opened the border, and then when President Reagan and Gorbachev were signing the INF Missile Treaty, they toasted the swim and said that it helped to change the relations between the two countries. That was exciting, really exciting to do, but from there I wanted to do something that was about human exploration. How do you go further than you've ever gone before? How do you find out the ca capacity of the human being? So I decided to do a swim in Antarctica in a bathing suit cap and goggles. The water temperature was 32 degrees. I trained for two years. I looked at the penguins and saw that the way they were able to stay warm was to create this layer of air between their feathers and their skin. And so I grew my hair really long, put my hair up on my head, put my bathing cap on and didn't squeeze it out, and used that air as a way to insulate my head. And then went with a crew to Antarctica to do the swim. I had doctors along with me that were monitoring me throughout the swim, that were making sure that I wasn't going into hypothermia, and then I had people on board the boat watching for leopard seals and also for icebergs. Um, we set off from the ship, the Orlova, and I started swimming with the goal of going one mile in 32 degrees. I'd like to go ahead and show the, the DVD for that <laughs> And there's that laugh. The champion swimmer caught a second win. How does she look? She looks sad. <laughs> there there was a sudden, there, not right now, there was a sudden, sudden like burst of energy. I think she realized she had so many more minutes to go. She's moving faster than we are. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the coldest water she's ever been swimming in. And yet her stroke rate is well into the mid 60s which means for her, she's doing as well as she's ever done. She's probably got something like 30 seconds to go. <laughs> She's done it. are no limits to what we can do and the idea is that as long as we keep training and believing and pushing and having teams of people around us
who, who say, yes, you can do it, and also those that challenge us and say, no, that you can't, we can do things that are unimaginable. And so from there, I'd go on to do swims through the Northwest Passage to follow in the wake of Raul Amundsen, who was the first man to reach the South Pole. I'd heard about Shackleton and about Scott trying to get to the South Pole. Scott got as far as the South Pole and died on the way back, but Amundsen was the first man. So what I decided to do was to follow his route and his success, first through the Northwest Passage and to the South Pole. And what I did after the swim in Antarctica was to swim off Greenland, Baffin Island, Puerto Bay, and, and Barrow, Alaska. And when I swam in Greenland, the water temperature was at 28.8 28 .8 degrees, and it dropped to 26.6. I swam a quarter of a mile. From there, I'd follow his course to Baffin Island and swim a mile in 28.8 degree water. And we'd, hate, we'd have to wait for the sea ice to melt so I could go through the ice there. From there, I'd go on to Pruda Bay and swim a mile and a half in 30 degree water and finish in Barrow. And I'd follow the course of his life and study him for the next seven years and write a book called South of the Sun. So the idea was that you know we keep trying to figure out how to do stuff that we've never been before, done before, but to look at these early explorers and to look at the template they create for overcoming huge obstacles, those templates can still be applied now to look at how to go through that process to achieve huge goals.